Welcome to the Wonder Learn Podcast. I'm your host, Francis Tapon. We are going to be flying today. We're flying with Robert De Laurentiis. He's also known as the Zen Pilot. He has flown across the entire world on one single trip on a plane called The Spirit of San Diego. That was a crazy, wild trip that he wrote a book about. And now he's doing something even more ambitious. He's going once again around the world, but this time the hard way, not around the equator, but instead going from pole to pole. So he's flying to the South Pole and then going all the way up to the North Pole. I catch up to him on his way up to the North Pole. He's stuck in Spain for three months during the Corona apocalypse, and he's trying to get to Sweden and on to the North Pole before the summer ends in the North Pole, which would be in July. It's very fun to learn about all the different issues that aviation brings and all the challenges because for most of us, we're used to just jet- jumping on a plane and we have to deal with buses and trains and, and, and cars. But exploring the world on a plane is a whole different ball game. I'm here with a frequent flyer. His name is Robert De Laurentiis. How are you, Robert? I'm doing well. That's the understatement of the day. The frequent flyer. <laughs> so uh, people may not have heard about your crazy adventures on a plane. Uh, give us a quick rundown of your your at least two, well, one one trip that you successfully went around the world, around the equator, more or less, and now you're doing it the hard way, going from pole to pole. Uh how long is this uh, your first journey take? And then talk, talk about the second trip, which you're trying to do in the middle of the COVID-19. Right. So in 2015, I did an equatorial circumnavigation in a plane we named the Spirit of San Diego. And then um, I left on this more ambitious trip, November 16th of 2019 from San Diego uh, over the poles. So I headed southbound to do a polar circumnavigation and the plane is called the Citizen of the World. It's a world peace flight. We're showcasing aviation safety and technology. And then we have some scientific experiments on board, as well as the fact that we're burning biofuels over the poles for the first time in the history of man or woman. This is really interesting and fascinating. I want to get into all that stuff. But first, I want to just get into how did you get into flying in the first place? What? How old were you? You know, Were you a little kid that was like seven years old and holding a plane in their hand and had a bunch of toy planes? You know, I think uh, people are born pilots, quite honestly. So it's an interest that small kids have. I, I saw a little girl when I was in Nairobi, Kenya. She was with her parents at a mall having uh, lunch. And there was a plane flying overhead, and I saw her point up at it. And her parents were totally ignoring it, but she seemed to be fascinated by it. So for me, it started with paper airplanes, then model planes, then string control, controlled, radio controlled. I uh, got into radio controlled, high performance aerobatic uh, model uh, planes or helicopters. And then eventually I learned how to fly. Wow. And, and how old were you? I was about 45. I didn't have the resources of time and money that flying takes until later in my life. Okay, so let's say somebody's listening to this and they already have a passion for it, and maybe they're a teenager or in their 20s, and they really want to get into it. Would you say, how about joining the military? That's one option. That was what I originally tried to do back in the day, but I didn't have the vision for it, and they were not uh, correcting eyesight back then. Nowadays, it might be a different story. And normally, I would say aviation is a wonderful career before you know the COVID-19 virus hit. But with the airlines basically grounded, I think it's going to take a little time to recover. But somebody starting out, it'll take them time to build up their hours and get the various licenses that are required. So it may not be the worst, worst time to start. It's a morbid thought, but I'm thinking about the September 11th suicide bombers who went to, I think it was in Florida, to learn how to fly. Uh, how much do these courses cost, and uh, and how long do they take, typically, if let's say you are got a moderate budget? You know, I imagine there's different speeds, how fast you can do it, but give us an idea of how much it costs. Well, let me first say that uh, some of those guys on the, the flights that hit the towers, they actually trained in San Diego, my hometown, believe it or not. Okay. Um, it's not a proud fact, but mm-hmm. to start off, people would have to get their visual flight uh, rules license, and there's a ground school portion of that. You can take those at community colleges if you're tight on a budget, or you can pay to attend a class. 
The expensive part comes with the uh, flight training in the air, and that typically takes about 40 to 60 hours. The airplane will cost you probably about 110 an hour. Your flight instructor, 50 to 60 bucks. For me, that first license actually took 60 hours. So you're probably looking at about 10 or 15 grand um, to make that happen. And then beyond that, there's your commercial airline uh, license. Um, there's also an IFR license, which is instrument flight rules, which you would need as well. Um, so I would say total, you're probably looking at about 30 grand at least. Okay, so but you- I mean, that's a lot. It is cheaper though than let's say, let's say your ambition is just to be a pilot or to be an aviator and that's your goal and you don't even want to go to college because I don't think you, or do you need to have a college degree before you go to aviation, you know, go through that whole training? No, you don't. It's my understanding. Okay, so, right. So therefore somebody who's just like dead set on being one and either doesn't have the military option because also the problem with the military, I suppose, is that there's no, uh, I don't think any military branch <clears throat> guarantees that you will be a pilot they have a selection process and you may get you might enlist for four or six years and then all of a sudden discover that you failed the selection process in year number one so that that could be a big problem yeah that can be tricky you know the funny thing though francis what was uh, getting close to happening was because there was a shortage of pilots the airlines were taking people with fewer and fewer hours and the regional carriers could not even get pilots to fly their planes so they were offering to pay for more and more training. It never, as far as I know, got to the point where they would pay for everything. But certainly there are some scholarships out there as well. Uh, my foundation, I hope to um, give some scholarships at some point in the future. But, um, you know, first the airlines, the airline industry needs to recover, I think, to stimulate a lot of this. Of course. Yeah. Big time. Uh, So you go through, let's say this training, if you really want to, I mean, college, for example, can easily cost, especially if you go to a private school, but even if you go to a public school um, can cost 30 grand or so. So if you really want to, you could, you could sacrifice that potentially. Um, And the whole process, if you're kind of in a hurry, can you do it all in about a year's time or how long would it take with all the flight hours you got to do? Well, you know, they have cram classes, which I actually don't recommend because when your life is at risk, you don't want to rush through the learning process. In fact, you really want to absorb as much as you can. That being said, um, you know, I've heard of people sort of moving through all this in just maybe six months or so, but to accumulate the number of hours uh, takes some time. And there's what's called a ATP, Airline Transportation Pilot, I believe it is. And there's a certain number of hours that people typically had have while they're taking that. So I don't know, it's been a while since I, I got my license, but I would say somewhere between one and two years at least to build the number of hours you need. And then how often do you have to kind of like renew your license, kind of like to prove that you can still fly? Um, usually uh, it's once a year you need to take a check ride. It depends on your insurance. For me with my last plane, they actually waived that a couple of times because I had so many flight hours. Uh, with the okay. plane I'm flying now, the Citizen of the World, which is a much, much more complicated plane, they have not waived that. They've always required that every year I get training with an instructor. Got it. Okay. And that training process, how long does that take? Uh, several days. Really? And you have to pay for that, I imagine. Oh, yeah. You Trust me, you keep paying and paying and paying. <laughs> um, and there's typically a day of ground school and maybe um, you know a day of flying. And then they split that up in different ways. So it just depends on your instructor. Wow. Okay. So it end up costing you how much to go through that process every year. Let's say you're not getting a ton of flight hours in and you still got to keep your license fresh. Um, if my memory serves me, I'd say somewhere between uh, 1500 and three grand at the level I'm at. For somebody who's not flying, you know, such a complicated, expensive plane, I'd say it might be half that. Um, And, you know, the plane, the citizen of the world with its turbine engines, actually turboprop, which means the jet engine that turns a propeller, there's two of them. Flight time in that plane runs about $1,000 an hour. If you're flying a 172, you're closer to $100 an hour. So it really depends on what you're flying and, you know, what you absolutely need. 
Yeah, I want to definitely get into the technology behind your plane because it sounds uh, quite fascinating. But first, I want to ask you about, again, the practical stuff regarding like pilot pay. I've heard that back in the day, back in the 60s or 70s or something like that, pilots were paid a lot of money and they it was a great way of life and a great uh, you know income stream. And then I've heard stories that, well, some people say that you can still get paid fairly well, um, but others say that they're paid almost like minimum wage. I mean, just like ridiculous. So I'm very confused. What is the reality? Uh, so, so I imagine that people who are bush pilots and are being paid far less than somebody who's doing a commercial airline, for example. Well, I know some of the commercial airlines are paying or were paying bonuses before, you know, the COVID-19. And, um, you know, of course, salaries start inching up when there is a shortage of pilots. And with the Asian markets opening up, they were pulling a lot of people from the United States. In the past, uh, low time pilots in the U.S. might go fly in Africa, get in a ton of hours, you know, flying uh, bush planes around. Even uh, single engine turboprop aircraft, I heard people with as low as like 200 hours would fly. So in the past, you could go to a different part of the world, get a bunch of hours and then come back to the U.S. and sign on with a major carrier. But, um, you know, who's to say what's going to happen in the next year? But mm -hmm. it's always been a cycle. You know, there were times when there was big demand for pilots. And then I think for about 10 years, there was um, not much. And then it was just booming before, you know, the COVID-19. Now, a lot of AI experts are predicting that pilots are going to be an obsolete profession, or at least largely obsolete, um, because planes already apparently, and I don't know how true this is either, but that they almost land themselves, they almost take off themselves at the pilot already, even today, at least on the maybe the Dreamliners, the big planes, the, the pilot's not doing much at all. Maybe the small little putt-putt planes are, are still very manual, but what is your take on that? I don't know if you'll ever get to a point where you would take a human 100% out of a cockpit. Uh, certainly they've reduced the workload and, you know, where they had flight engineers and just navigators before they have pilots and co-pilots only now. So it's probably headed in the direction of having, you know, maybe one less person in the cockpit, but I don't really see any time soon where they would totally eliminate you know, all human involvement. Right, but it could be a 50% drop if they get rid of the co-pilot in certain situations. Yeah, that's possible. And, you know, with the drones they're flying now, it's it's certainly headed in that direction. Right. So tell us a little bit about the technology behind your plane, your your first one, the Spirit of, of San, Diego, oh, San Diego. And how did that compare to the current beast that you're flying right now? And by the way, I forgot to mention at the very beginning, you're stuck right now in Spain. You have a fascinating story. You, you left from the South Pole and you're heading to the North Pole. And you kind of like all of a sudden during that time, the Corona apocalypse came and you're kind of grounded. Yeah, I uh, had intended to spend some time in Europe because it takes about six months for the summer at the South Pole to become, you know, summer at the North Pole. I had hoped to be moving around Europe a little bit more. I've been in Spain for little over three months now. And I leave in just a couple days to fly to Sweden, which is really um, the only realistic place to fly from here, because a lot of places are demanding a two-week quarantine, like England is. Uh, I was going to fly to Switzerland, but the word is they're going to be closed to outside traffic, including people who are presently in the EU, uh, until July 15th. So that's out. And we're looking at different options in terms of flying out of Sweden uh, to the North Pole and possibly on to Alaska. The other option is just to go up to the North Pole, come back, and then work my way across the North Atlantic via Iceland, Greenland, that, that sort of route. But to um, answer your question, my last plane, the Spirit of San Diego, was not as advanced as what I'm flying now. Uh, since that plane uh, flew in 2015, there's some new technology that's come out. I have an uh, infrared camera on the nose of the citizen of the world, which helps with nighttime landings and uh, also in light uh, weather, like light clouds. I have uh, automatic dependent surveillance broadcast, ADSB in and out, which helps with uh, traffic and terrain. 
so you can see uh, other planes and weather. But of course, that information has to be broadcast. And in a lot of parts of the world, it just simply is not. Uh, I have um, satellite comms and music in, in both aircraft. Um, I do have uh, satellite weather in the um, citizen of the world. And beyond that, uh, I've upgraded with a backup attitude indicator, which is uh, battery powered. So if I lose the entire cockpit, I'll still have that display, which shows me the horizon, shows me which, what course I'm on, what altitude, and if I'm turning. So I could fly the plane with just that one instrument. And that is pretty much it. Some of the, like the transponder now in NGT 9000 is much more sophisticated and has more information uh, on the last plane, it just squawked a code that could be seen by radar operators. This new one has a lot, lot more information, including traffic, terrain, uh, weather, that sort of thing. Well, wow, that's fascinating. I imagine I was just listening to the podcast, which is a great one. It's called 13 Minutes to the Moon by the BBC. Have you heard of it? I have not. Okay, you would, I think you would love it, assuming that you like space exploration, because the first one, the original one, was about the Apollo 11 landing. And again, you have Neil Armstrong making these last-minute manual adjustments trying to just as he's trying to land on the moon, because he only has a few seconds of fuel left as he's trying to land. And a lot of it's just manual, because the computers there were like not that sophisticated, obviously, in 1969. And then conversely, they had to they talked on their second podcast season, they talked about Apollo 13. And again, the guy is using his attitude indicator because the whole ship has been blown off in the electronics and they've got to do in their reentry to the earth. They're doing all the stuff, eyeballing it and using their stopwatch to figure out what angle that they should approach the earth. It's fascinating. Like what people have done, let alone, let's say Amelia Earhart or um, uh, what's his name? The, uh, I'm blanking on his name. The guy, Charles Lincoln. Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, Lindbergh. Um, you know, what those guys did with so little electronics, effectively, or no electronics. Well, you know, you hit on a few points. Um, when I cross the South Pole, and in the future when I cross the North Pole, you lose a lot of your navigation. You're not going to be getting a GPS signal. So I lost my um, flight management systems, which are like GPS units. And I was using a line of position on the sun, my iPad, and what's called a directional gyro, which is a little metal ball that spins at uh, 15,000 RPMs. So you basically dead reckon on a course, you know, to cross the pole. And mentioning Armstrong, uh, Mark Armstrong, the son of Neil Armstrong, is uh, supposed to fly a leg of this flight with me when I get to up near Washington State, if all goes oh, well. Wow. And the final thing is you're talking about spacecraft. We're carrying a NASA wafer scale spaceship on the citizen of the world, which will put guys like Buzz Aldrin out of work. Um, he seems to think, I saw him speak uh, not so long ago at the Explorers Club in New York City, and he thought that there will always be a astronaut in the cockpit. But um, the wafer scale spaceships, they eliminate the engines and the fuel and basically use an electromagnetic cannon to be blast out into outer space. It actually uses the same amount of energy, but, um, you know, you eliminate a lot of the complexities and you can shoot a wafer scale spaceship every 15 minutes out into outer space. And the one I carry is very basic, but imagine about the size of a small dish it's a circuit board, and it can collect pictures, um, altitude, speed, location, um, temperature, you know, different different uh, things that you might want to measure. So let me see if I get you right. Uh, are you saying that there are these wafer-sized, so the size of, let's say, a pancake, effectively, these electronic circuit board that can be launched into space at a very low cost? Right. And because you don't have the human factor, these little wafer scale spaceships can be subjected to huge G loads, right? Because there's nobody to pass out. And mm -hmm. if you don't have to lift a lot of fuel and a big rocket motor into space, what's left, right? right. Um, and that's the direction I think they're going. How long have you heard of the. Go ahead. 
Uh, have you heard of the John, uh, I think, Neumann probes? I don't know if I, if I pronounced that correctly. I have not. Okay, John van Neumann, I think he was a Hungarian Jewish scientist, uh, actually, anyway, genius. He was in the 19, I think, 50s or so. And he posited this idea that there should be these little, uh, I think they're called Neumann machines, that they're like nanobots, effectively, and that, that an advanced civilization would just spread the entire universe, trillions upon trillions, perhaps even self-replicating, of these little tiny uh, dust-sized particles that that have computers on them, and they would use it to explore the universe. And you wouldn't need any kind of physical spaceship to go out there because they would do all the heavy lifting. And then once that you've you've kind of mapped everything out with these little micro uh, explorers, then you would actually maybe follow up the more interesting areas. So it's very similar. I guess we're taking our very first step with these kind of wafer thin spaceships that you have on board of your own ship. <laughs> Well, you just gave me the perfect segue into our second experiment, which is testing for particles in the atmosphere, but actually plastic particles. And they've established that there's plastics, meaning microfibers, on the ground all over the planet, including at the South Pole and in every body of water. But nobody's tested the atmosphere all the way around the planet. And more recently, they're thinking that it might be possible for the COVID virus to live on these microfibers. So on this next leg from the epicenter of, you know, the coronavirus here in Europe, which is where I'm at in Spain, Madrid, in a day or two, um, to the next spot, Sweden, we'll be testing the atmosphere, which is an interesting, you know, time and place to be, quite honestly. Yeah, I also imagine that scientists will be fascinated by how human pollution has dramatically reduced because not only are there fewer planes in the sky, but there are fewer cars in the road. I imagine for uh, from nature's perspective, they would be very, quite happy with 2020 because suddenly the earth has time to recover and breathe <laughs> from all our normal pollution. <laughs> well, from what I hear, there's going to be quite a bit more time to recover. But, uh, <laughs> that, you know, that's another Another benefit of this experiment, right? Because you could see before the virus or before the quarantine and then after. So right. it, it's going to be pretty, pretty interesting. It's not the most high tech experiment. We're basically using double sided sticky tape to collect these particles. But, um, you know, sometimes experiments don't have to be complicated to be effective. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the little wafer thin spaceships you have you're not actually going to I, mean, I didn't that's one thing i didn't understand you don't actually have to launch it into space yourself you just it's going to be launched into the atmosphere only it's not going to go into uh orbit well actually it's inside the plane on one of the uh, windows and it has three suction cups that attach it to the window and then i have a usb cable that i plug into it for power so it's actually recording this data from inside the plane. Excellent. And so that's and so it's kind of like a first test to see, okay, if it can do it here on the atmosphere of the Earth, then one day we can launch it into space and, and have it detect stuff in space. Right, right. And this particular wafer scale spaceship uh, has only been up in a hot air balloon and on a drone around the UC Santa Barbara ca uh, campus. And you'll be delighted to hear that it's actually named Francis. Uh, <laughs> and I named it after my mother. So her name is spelled a little differently than yours. But um, yeah, Francis is getting an e-ticket ride around the planet. <laughs> That's fantastic. Okay, so give us a little bit of a talk a little bit about your first book. Um, and then what were some of the, the challenges in going around the world, around the equator, and then Later, we'll talk about the big challenges of going pole to pole because it's like an order of magnitude more complicated and dangerous. Yes, very much so. The first book was called Flying Through Life, and it was about incorporating spiritual practices in business. And once I did that with my business, um, well, I had attended a three-year advanced graduate program in spiritual psychology with an emphasis in consciousness, health, and healing. And I was learning these concepts and applying them in my business, and it tripled in size. 
So with that extra money, I bought that first plane and wanted to show the world that it worked. I didn't want to just talk about it. I wanted to be a real presence in the world and um, be the example. So that's when I did this flight around the equator. And in the process of that, I had my engine in that plane. It was a single engine piston plane fail over the Strait of Malacca at 14,000 feet. So I dead sticked, which means flying without power for about 19.6 nautical miles uh, over the Strait of Malacca, over the dense jungles of Malaysia into an international airport. And Zen Pilot, Flight of Passion and the Journey Within is the second book and starts at that point of the engine failing. And it's about the trip across the Pacific Ocean, which, of course, is the, the biggest ocean. And it's, you know, I was flying in a plane with an engine that had failed. So I doubted the engine. I doubted myself. And in the process, I learned many lessons, which we called Zen Moments. And my theory is that when you fly, you learn lessons about life. So, for example, when the engine failed, my first thought was, this plane is trying to kill me, right? Like the universe is trying to take me out. And what I came to realize as a Zen moment is actually the plane was keeping me alive. And it was just sort of warming me up for what was to come. So there was, there was uh, you know, many Zen moments throughout that book. And once I got back to the U.S. and, you know, did a lecture circuit, finished writing the book and got some products out there, eventually we wanted to go even bigger. And that was one of the premises or it was a premise of the first book, which was to pursue the impossibly big dream. So after you fly around the equator of the earth, the next thing would be to fly from pole to pole. And we were a little bit overconfident. And I assumed that that would take six months, like planning for the first trip took. I knew it would be harder, but we were smarter, you know, more experienced, had a little better budget. And we were humbled in the process because instead of taking six months, it was delayed three times. And eventually it would take 18 months before I could actually depart. And now you're being delayed once again in a big way. <coughs> um, excuse me. Yeah, I am getting delayed. Um, Do you have to pay fees in Madrid? I uh, imagine like parking fees or whatever you want to call it for your for your plane. It probably adds up pretty quick. Well, that's going to be a big question because normally they charge 25 euro a day at uh, Cuatro Vientos, which is a smaller airport just next to Madrid. But since I haven't been able to leave, it doesn't seem appropriate that they would charge me parking if they were forcing me to stay. Now, right. you know, how convincing an argument I can make to the guy who collects fees is uh, to be determined. Um, <laughs> considering Spain is a socialist communist country, I think my chances of getting that fee waived uh, may be small, but I'll give it my best shot. Well, at least it's cheaper than parking your car in New York City. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> and at least I know the, the plane will be there when I show up later, right? That's another right. <laughs> Is that it? Um, what, so give us a little bit of some practical things that happened during the Corona apocalypse that kind of you just landed in Spain. You're hoping to fly around Europe. And then you also mentioned that you want to go through Washington state. I think it, you said somewhere. Is that on the way back from the pole? Yeah. After I fly over the uh, magnetic North pole, the true North pole and the North pole of inaccessibility, I'll go into Alaska uh, through Canada. What the, and, sorry, and, what the, wait, 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 New York, what did you, what, what, pole of inaccessibility? What's that? Right. If you take um, the North Atlantic, there's basically a land mass that sort of uh, is around the North Pole, right? At a great distance. And if you find the exact center of that, those different land masses, there's a point in the ocean that's considered the least accessible place for that entire body of water. And that's the North pole of inaccessibility. Uh -huh. So it's, it's not so far from the other poles that I mentioned. So I have that point charted out and I will fly over that as well. There are also some 
uh, airports, uh, calling airports sounds a little generous, but I understand, I think the Russians maybe have uh, airports on the ice, at least maybe are they temporary, I imagine, because they're not there all year long? Yeah, they're temporary. They don't last for very long. They're ice runways. And I actually have a buddy I talked to on the phone yesterday. His name is Ron Sheardown, a very, very experienced pilot um, in the North Atlantic region, flew a lot of rescue missions. And he took a plane up there, actually a couple planes, him and Dick Rattan, who's a very famous aviator as well. And they landed at the North Pole. And one of the planes, which was a Russian built plane, um, started to sink into the ice. So they were stranded there for a period of time. Eventually they got rescued because it's uh, not that hard to get to the North Pole. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a different animal, you know, and with the planet warming up, it's more difficult to uh, land there. Well, you said, well, wait, you said something that was interesting. You said it's not that difficult to get to the North Pole. I thought it was difficult to get to the North Pole. <laughs> Um, no, the, the North pole is much easier to get to than the South pole. Um, because would, of the altitude, uh, the distance from, uh, the nearest mm. airport and the temperature is warmer as well because right. you have ice floating on water. Whereas at the South pole, you have 8,200 feet of snow and ice on top of a sea level land mass. Right. So, and yeah, much drier temperatures. I don't know if that makes it worse or better. Um, I don't know. Drier, I have... drier, less humidity, at least. I know that the South Pole is, is super dry, driest right. place on Earth. Right. I'd have to think about the consequences of that. But, um, you know, you have navigation issues, but the North Pole is very well traveled with commercial airliners, at least close to that. So um, really the biggest issue is the, well, a couple issues, the distance and then the risk of fuel falling is much less because it's warmer at the North Pole. We did so many things to my aircraft to make sure that the fuel was warm enough so it wouldn't gel. Because if the fuel gels, then you lose both engines. Wow. And what fly, what altitude do you typically fly at? Um, well, I flew the South Pole at 32,000 feet, and that was in part because it's more efficient up there. And when you're stretching the limits of your plane, the higher you go, the faster and further you can go. So um, that was necessary to make it that distance. My plane, the Citizen of the World, was designed to fly about 2,000 nautical miles. And the leg to the uh, South Pole and back was 4,200. So better than double the distance. And if How you think you pull that off, um, that's that's a long story. We did over 50 <laughs> modifications to the plane and I used Mother Nature to hop a ride on some tailwinds as well. But, you know, everything from a ceramic coating on the outside of the plane, we uh, stripped out the inside and saved probably three, four hundred pounds. We replaced the uh, inefficient engines with Predator drone engines we had uh, custom five-bladed nickel tip scimitar composite props built by MT Propeller. Um, we replaced the existing environmental system with a lighter, more efficient system that pressurized the plane with outside air as opposed to lead air from the, the turbines and cooling it and, and pressurizing. There was many things we did, many, many, many things. That's fascinating. And when do you hope to finish? Obviously, you're going to go to Sweden next in a few days. And then will Sweden allow you to proceed or do you have to wait until you get more clearance for the... Because I don't know when... You don't go straight from Sweden straight to the North Pole, right? There's probably another stop. Well, I could. See, if I was leaving from Svalbard, Norway... Um, yeah, that's true direct to the North Pole, and then to Prudhoe Bay in Alaska, it's only 2,000 nautical miles. Now, I expect to hit a headwind on that leg, so I need to use my ferry tanks. Um, I had a issue with one of the ferry tanks that literally burst in Dakar. What is a ferry tank? Um, well, I have six of them inside the plane, and they're extra fuel tanks that you add. So the plane was designed to carry somewhere between nine and 13 people. 
and I can barely just squeeze into the entry of the plane and get to the pilot seat and there's room for a co-pilot if I, you know, was bringing one. So imagine all those other spaces where other people would normally sit are just tank after tank after tank. Wow. And how, do, and I imagine there's some sort of automatic system so you don't have to get out of your seat to go fill up the tank. <laughs> well, um, there's 20 valves that have to be properly aligned. And then there's two fuel pumps as backups and you use the cabin pressurization to push the fuel from inside the tanks into the wings, actually into one wing. And then you cross connect the two wings to level it out or balance it out. Very, very complicated system. I um, got with a guy named Fred Sorensen, who quite honestly in the aviation community is pretty close to a, a, well, he's a legend. I was going to, pump him a little bit and say he was a god, but this was the most um, complicated fuel system he ever designed in the 40 plus years he's been doing this. So, you know, that was a concern to me because you don't want complex when you're flying over the South Pole, you want simple. But in order to get the range out of this plane, we really had to use the best technology and some complicated systems and then just pray to God it all worked. And so you're planning to then go to Sweden. You imagine going to Stockholm first, and then you go to Svalbard after that. And then from there, is that the plan? Or you still have to get clearance from to get land in Alaska? Um, I'm going to Malmo first, which is at the southern part of Sweden. And part of the reason for that is I have someone there who's going to help me, I believe, with a repair on the uh, ferry system. And then going into Sweden allows me to fly um, while... I wait for my film crew to get access to Sweden. We're hoping that's going to happen on the 15th, but that, you know, is nobody knows for sure. So if I end up waiting there for a month, I want the ability to fly around to different parts of Sweden to keep my skills up because it's been almost two months since I last flew that plane. And that has me a little bit nervous, quite honestly. Yeah, it's better to take short hops and get your flying wings back on there. Yeah, and I don't even need to take short hops. I could just, you know, do a circuit around the country and practice some instrument approaches and, um, you know, accomplish what I need to do, which is to stay current. Right. It's So when do you hope to finish? In 2020? Right. I think the optimum time for crossing the North Pole is sometime in July. August um, would be getting a little late, but, you know, if I absolutely had to, I could. Um, and then it'll take me probably a month to get through the United States, you know, through Alaska, Canada, then the United States again, and then into San Diego. So I'm looking at August, September timeframe. You don't have to go through Canada though. If you didn't want to, you could go down through Juneau, right? Um, well, it's impossible to get from Alaska, I believe down into the United States on the route I want to take, but typically you can overfly that portion and, um, you know, just skip it if you want. But I'm going to do an interview with a electric plane company there for the docu-series that we're filming. Okay, great. Now, one of the hardest places for land-based people, in other words, those who are trying to go to, uh, let's say, Antarctica, is the Drake Passage. I know it's notorious, probably the most dangerous uh, piece of water out there on the planet. How is it in the air? Is it no different than anywhere else, or is it also a scary uh, place to pass? I'd, I'd say terrifying is the word I use. Um, wow. A week before I departed, there was a Chilean C-130 military transport that went down in the Drake Passage. It had uh, 36 souls on board. Everybody was killed. It had two pilots compared to you know just me, if I compare the aircraft. Um, they had experience in Antarctica. I had none. They had better weather. Mine was worse. That plane, you know, that model of plane has millions and millions of hours across the globe, right? Because there's lots of them out there. And then the other thing was they were only flying about two hours. They were going from Punta Arenas, I believe, or a little further north across the Drake Passage to King George Island. And in comparison, I was flying 18 hours, 
so nine times as long. And my thought was, how can I make it if these guys with twice as many engines, you know, experience, better weather, two pilots, better plane, they can't make it. And that what happened to them? Well, nobody knows for sure, I believe, the last I heard, but they think the wing spar may have broken. And, you know, my plane was overloaded with fuel, so, and it was older, it's 1983, so I was a little, little is another understatement for today. I was very concerned, you know, whether the plane could actually handle that load. That is scary. I'm not even sure what the wind spar is. It's sort of this, the wing has a a central member that's the, the thickest piece that supports the most weight. And to the credit of our our team and our effort, um, I found the engineer that had designed that wing for Gulfstream, which was the company that owned the rights to this plane for just a very short period of time. And I found him and he did a feasibility study on the wing and told us exactly how much fuel we could carry. So, you know, that gave me some comfort. And he was, I think, close to 90 years old. And when I got a hold of him, it was like, yeah, I'm going to retire tomorrow. And, uh, you know, he was joking, but not really. And he ended up doing the project as his last project. So very fortunate to have found him. His name was Fred Katz. Man, fascinating. By the way, I, I was looking over my questions and I forgot, and I never did get a, a, a an answer because I, I didn't ask it clearly enough, but like, Dollar for dollar, what do pilots get paid nowadays? Like, how much does a bush pilot get paid? How much does an airline pilot get paid? Roughly, I know it varies from country to country, etc. You know, I'm, I'm. You got to take everything I'm giving you about commercial airline pilots uh, with a grain of salt because I have not been. You know, I've not worked for the airlines, but um, I know for a corporate pilot that would fly a plane like maybe mine or you know something bigger. Um, with jet engines, you're probably looking at $600 a day. Um, and then I think people starting with uh, the, the commercial airlines are probably making somewhere between twenty and 40000 a year. And bush pilots, um, I don't know exactly. I'm guessing like one to $200 a day maybe. That's, that's a guess. Yeah. So, I mean, it goes back to what some people have told me, which is this idea that, you know, we're entrusting the person who's flying a jet airliner with a bunch of passengers on board to somebody who might not have a high school. I mean, who might have just a high school diploma and who's getting paid only 30 grand a year. Yeah. And, you know, they're grabbing as many or they were grabbing as many people as they could. And some of the people that were getting these jobs that I knew I, I was thinking to myself, hmm, that's a little bit of a stretch there. You know, I don't think that that maybe that person is the best pilot. There was one guy, um, he knew that the airlines needed people with hours of flight time. So he bought a very, very old plane and then he'd get it up in the air and just throttle it back and just do sort of circuits across, you know, the country without doing a whole lot of maneuvers, just letting the engine run up in the air. And that's not really what you want. You want somebody who's doing takeoffs and landings, you know, instrument departures and approaches. Um, You want them going through the series of possible, you know, challenges they might have. So the airlines were starting to grab people with, you know, less and less flight time. And they were sort of out of the, the top pilots. So I was sort of waiting to see if, if that would start showing itself in terms of accidents and incidents. I don't know if that ever happened, and that may be a testament to the training program programs that the airlines have. But, yeah, they were starting to grab from the bottom of the barrel. Wow. And that's kind of scary. When you book a flight on a commercial airline, what do you often look for? Do you look for the model of the plane and say, okay, I don't want to fly that leg because that's an old plane, for example? Or, you know, that's a 737. I don't trust a 737. I'd rather be on a Dreamliner or vice versa. You know, actually the opposite. I I relax when I'm on a commercial plane. Those planes, at least in the United States, are very well maintained. The pilots are generally 
um, very experienced, at least the captain, you know, the senior pilot, um, good training, um, good equipment. And the air traffic control system, I think, in the United States is one of the best in the world. So every plane that's flying commercially is more than likely on an instrument flight plan. So it's being tracked on radar. You know, there's altitudes that you can fly at, that you have to fly at if you're traveling in one direction versus another. Um, You know, they sequence the planes. The planes have good equipment for the most part. I think um, in the United States, it's a very, very safe place to fly. That's a good uh, note to for all of us who have a, a fear of flying um so what's next once you finally land you're hoping that you'll go over the north pole in july and then it will take you about a month or so so maybe august september maybe september is when you're finally back in san diego i suppose is home right yeah the the plan is to survive first of all and i was having a conversation <laughs> with eric Lindbergh the grandson of Charles Lindbergh, who should fly, I hope, if we can still make it work, uh, the penultimate leg of the flight into Lindbergh Field. And he said to me, he goes, you realize you just have one mission. And I was thinking about all the missions I thought I had. And he goes, your only mission is to survive. And he was, he's right about that, you know, very stressful, challenging, risky thing I'm doing. But, um, once I get back, you know, I'll be lecturing. I'll um, finish off my fourth book, which is Peace Pilot to the Ends of the Earth and Beyond. Uh, I'm committed to doing some lectures at the Smithsonian, which is to me like one of the great honors of, you know, this, this whole trip. Um, yesterday, we released a book called uh, The Little Plane That Could. It's a children's book for kids ages three to five on Amazon and on um, um the uh the the electronic version as well i'm trying to kindle Mm -hmm. so i'll be promoting that um the plane has a bunch of maintenance uh to have done and i'm going to get it painted one of the sponsors has agreed to paint it so it's it's pretty beaten up right now after uh dodging a cyclone out of madagascar it ripped a lot of the paint off Mm -hmm. so yeah i'll be fairly busy you know and i'm hoping that that will create some opportunities for the future. I don't know that I need to fly the South Pole again. I assess my chance for surviving that at 50%, which meant, you know, when I left my hotel room in Punta, not Punta Arenas, in Ushuaia, Argentina, I had packed up all my personal belongings and stacked them in the corner. So if the hotel manager had to send my stuff home, it wouldn't be too much work for him. So that was a risk I was willing to take once in my life, but never again. Um, and then I'm going to just see what you know presents itself. My dad asked me to get a country club membership and stop with all the the crazy. <laughs> so we'll we'll see what direction um, you know I'm taken. But I remember when I was coming back from the South Pole, and I was low on fuel. I had the Drake Passage to fly over. Uh, had lost communications with the air traffic controller. Um, and there was a cloud layer over the airport. And I, I was concerned about doing an instrument approach in because there could be other planes doing that. And I descended through the clouds over the ocean without knowing how thick the cloud layer was. Um, I just, uh, I was asking myself, you know, how hard does this have to be? Why? Is the universe continuing to test me like this? You know, what, what does it have planned for me that I have to be put through all this? So, um, you know, I'm trying to figure that out. One of the things I realized is that in order to get the most out of this trip, I had to be sort of broken open. So they say that to let the light in, something has to be broken open. And that was the most challenging flight, maybe moment, 18 hour period of my life. And I survived it. And I think I've been open to the the things that are being presented to me on the remainder of the flight, which I actually consider our global victory lap because everything after the South Pole is 
much easier in comparison. That's amazing. Now I know, Robert, why they call you the Zen pilot. <laughs> well, they're starting to call me the peace pilot because our mission, you know, was to connect the two places on the planet where peace has always existed, the South and North Pole and everybody in between. And really the plane is simply the vehicle for our message. But uh, I'm proud to you know, be called the Zen pilot as well as the peace pilot. Very good. Now, why didn't you go first to the North Pole, since that was it's a bit easier than the South Pole, and then save the South Pole for last? Let's say when you've got your your wing, uh, we call it training legs, but whatever you, I know, more experience with your own plane. Uh, and why didn't you tackle? Why did you tackle the South Pole kind of early first before the North Pole? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the reason was because timing mostly. So if it was summertime, it made sense to go over the North Pole first. If it was wintertime, it made sense to go over the South Pole first because our winter in the U.S. is the summer at the South Pole. The other thing was because on the first trip, I realized the aircraft performance degraded over time. So I wanted to have the plane as fresh as it could be when I went south over the South Pole. And then the final reason was because I didn't want that stress anticipating what was to come, excuse me, for the entire trip. So it's kind of like um, having a final exam at the end of the year. You worry about it all year long. And I didn't want to have that stress with me on every leg of the trip leading up to that. And um, the other thing is I figured that if I made the South Pole – and then something happened a little further along, and for whatever reason, the, the trip wasn't able to be completed, I, will, I would have done the hardest, longest leg, and we could still find some things to celebrate. Well, I'm celebrating you already, even though you're not finished. Um, but uh, we will keep track of you. Can you tell our listeners how you they can follow your journey along through probably Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook and your website, etc. Yeah, the best place to start would be the website, which is uh, www.pole, so P O L E 2 T O, pole again, flight, so pole to pole flight.com. And if you go to, you know, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, uh, Pinterest, uh, Facebook, and type in Robert De Laurentiis or Zen Pilot, uh, you should be able to find me pretty easily. And I'll also put all those links in the show notes, as well as your uh, links to your books that uh, you have put together. I, I congratulate you. I know how hard it is to to write a book. And I, what is the, the last question is, is what is your big fear? I know you've got the hard part over with, but sometimes you don't want to let your guard down because obviously the North Pole is not a walk in the park. So what is your b biggest concern going over the North Pole? What keeps you up at night? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, maybe a better question would be what doesn't keep me up at night. Um, <laughs> um, I guess my biggest concern right now is the fuel system for the plane because, you know, I've had one tank burst uh, in Dakar and that sprayed jet fuel on my eyes, face, shoulders, you know, chest, legs, groin, and burned me pretty severely, quite honestly. Um I've lost a little faith in that system. Part of the reason that burst was because I misaligned one of the 20 valves and that stressed out one of the tanks, maybe two. So I would say that's probably the biggest concern. And when I take off, you know, I'll, I'll move the fuel from the ferry tanks into the wings as soon as there's space for it. One of the things we're looking at is if I can get up to the northern tip of Norway then I could fly to the North Pole and then fly right back to Norway and then go a little further south and then over to Greenland and Iceland and just avoid the use of the ferry tanks altogether. Um, so that would be a way to mitigate that risk. But aside from that, um, that's really my biggest concern because the plane is flying very reliably now which is not something we saw in the three years leading up to my departure it was actually quite miraculous that as soon as I started the trip, everything sort of settled down because 
you know, when you take a 1983 aircraft and put the big engines and props on there, you fly it um, 7,000 feet higher than it was designed and you overload it with fuel, um, something's going to give. And we saw multiple systems failing. We actually saw almost everything failing prior to the trip. You know, I had the windshield cracking at 30,000 feet. I had the fuel controllers to the engines um, freezing up. And I had the uh, one engine, I wasn't able to restart it when we did a test to shut it down. So I had to land on one engine. Um, Environmental system um, failed early on, but... You know, all those things are now miraculously working very, very well. So I do have some faith in the plane, uh, much more confidence than I ever had. It's working really well. Uh, and, you know, it's a testament to some of the engineering now, too. Um, avionics, I'm pretty confident with right now. Um, yeah, the distance is not too bad. Temperatures will be good. Um, I'm certainly more experienced than when I was headed south. So, yeah, if I can get the fuel into those uh, wing tanks, then I'll be set. And by the way, there there are planes that go, maybe it's a C-130, I don't know, there's probably multiple, maybe it's an Otter, but that can go from Punta Arenas in, or Ushuaia, go to the South Pole, and then continue on to South Africa. Is that I imagine that's within easily within the realm of some planes, but obviously not your plane. Right. Mine is a general aviation plane, which means uh, basically a smaller aircraft. The um, those C one thirties, and I think it's the there's a Russian cargo plane. I don't know if they actually fly that to the South Pole, but um, you know those planes have huge fuel bladders inside them. So they can bring some fuel to the South Pole. So those otters can land there, refuel, and go back. But that's a very complicated thing. And there are very few planes on the planet, I would say, unless you start getting into the really, really big aircraft um, or very, very small aircraft that are heavily modified that can go there and back nonstop. In fact, I don't know any that could land there turn around and go back unless it was like a C-130 with some huge, huge fuel bladders inside. Um, I only know of one other person uh, who's done the same or similar flight that I've done, but he was in a very small, I believe it was a Lance Air, and it was basically a flying fuel tank. But that was a piston aircraft, which tend to be more efficient than turbine aircraft. It had never been done before in a turboprop, either single engine or twin engine like mine. So that those were records, uh, you know, polar circumnavigation with a turboprop um, in that weight class. That was a record using biofuels over the uh, South Pole. That was a record. Um, yeah, there's definitely some records that have been set. Amazing. Well, you spent an hour with our audience. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And we hope you have the enjoyable journey as you go over the North Pole, complete your quest. And I hope you've inspired some people. And uh, we will be following your journey. Zen pilot, Robert De Laurentiis. Thanks, Francis. I appreciate your interest in my trip. Um, I appreciate your help in getting the message out. And uh, I appreciate what you're doing for aviation and the planet by sharing this. And that concludes this episode of the Wander Learn podcast, where we explore travel, technology, and transformation. If you'd like to see the show notes with links to what we talked about, or if you'd like to comment on the show, or if you'd like to ask me a question, then go to wanderlearn.com and click on this episode. If you'd like to connect with me, just remember FTAPON. That's my first initial and my last name. FTAPON is the username I use on all social media. You can also get to my website by going to ftapon.com. And here's one last reason to remember FTAPON. If you like what I do and would like to get rewarded for supporting my projects, then go to patreon.com slash FTAPON. That's where you can pick up some remarkable rewards for as little as $2 a month. And now for five quick favors. Number one, subscribe to the Wander Learn podcast. Two, download it. Three, share it. Four, review it somewhere. And five, sign up for my newsletter at wanderlearn.com. 
Our theme music was composed by Eric Stratman. This is Francis Tapon encouraging you to wander and learn.